Good morning, it's Peter here. Hey Peter, this is Tim Briglin calling. Um, Thank you. Th thanks for joining us this morning. I just wanted to let you, I'm the um, chair of the House Energy and Technology Committee, and um, we've got you uh, phoning in to our committee room. Um, there are- Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we have nine members of our committee, and uh, seven of us are here right now. So um, hey, ho hopefully we'll. Turn up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wish uh, I could be there as people wander in and out. Well, we, we hope to uh, we hope to meet you in purpose at, uh, in, in person at some point uh, in the future. But really appreciate you being able to join us this morning. Um, just you know, as you know, we're we're um, taking some testimony on the USF, and I know that you uh, have. Uh, a history with that in Vermont, and so um, it's for that reason, it's, it's good to have you as an expert on the phone. Um, what I wanted to let you know ahead of time, um, uh, our committee assistant, Sarah, had mentioned that you probably have about a half an hour of testimony and then um, some, some time for questions. What, what I want to alert you, you to, and members of the committee as well, is that we have a, um, a quickly compacting morning in terms of our schedule. So sure. I think I'll just start off with saying that uh, we'll take 45 minutes with you um, and anticipate that being um, you sharing uh, your thoughts with us for a half an hour and then you know if we have 15 minutes for questions or, or whatnot, that, that would be terrific if that works for you. Okay. Um, Ch Chairman Brigland, I don't really know uh, all about the committee's interests. Um, I have yep. prepared uh, testimony on a variety of topics. Yep. Should I try to just forge ahead and begin with the first one and then let you uh, give me feedback as I go, or do you want me to give you an outline of, of what I am planned to say? Um, you know, I'll let you um, handle it as, as you see fit. Um, okay. Just to be clear, though, um, we're in the process of working on um, a piece of legislation that deals with um, broadband connectivity in the state. One of the yeah. things that would potentially fund some of the initiatives that uh, you know the governor and folks in the legislature are interested in would be an increase in the USF fee in Vermont um, from two percent to two and a half percent. Okay. Um, it's something that the legislature actually I'll say it's something that the Vermont House of Representatives has passed. Um, on multiple occasions in recent years, um, it hasn't quite gotten through in the Senate. Um, but at any rate, it's it's continues to be a place that we look to for funding um, additional connectivity initiatives in the state. And so, Great. you being an expert on that, that, that was in yeah. particular why we had interest in, in you joining us this morning. So, um, but if, you know, if, there, if there are things beyond that, Peter, Pat in the room. He is. Hi, Peter. How are you? <laughs> Hi, Avram. <laughs> so. Nice to be working with you again. You too. Uh, okay, I'll start. Yeah, take uh, it away, please. I, uh, okay. Peter, you my start? background. My background is that I. Uh, Worked at the Legislative Council for about ten, for 10 years, just about exactly, back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, then I went over to work for Governor Cunin for a couple of years as uh, Deputy Secretary of Administration. And uh, I finished my career, about just about half of it, a little more, at the Public Service Board, um, ending up as the Policy Director over there. And I spent a lot of time uh, with the Commerce Committee and the Senate Finance Committee uh, working on various pieces of utility legislation, a lot of them uh, sort of social benefit things. Um, Representative Pat and I worked together on uh, some uh, uh, some funding for uh, re rehabbing housing and making it more energy efficient. Uh, that's how I one of the ways I knew him. Uh, anyway, I I wound up uh, sort of making a specialty of universal service during my public service board time. I um, worked with the Commerce Committee mainly in drafting the legislation that first became the, the, the USF law. And I sort of stuck with it in, at the federal level. Uh, later I served for about 10 years on the Universal Service Joint Board and then something else similar that was called the Joint Board on Separation, which was a federal-state collaboration. So I got to see sort of the universal service picture from uh, a lot of different angles. Um, on the other hand, I have lived now in Massachusetts near my grandchildren for about almost 10 years, seven years. And uh, 
I haven't been reading the Vermont papers, so there's a lot that has passed in Vermont that I uh, have only been told about and maybe some important things that I don't even know about at all. So you, you have to be the judge of that. So let, let me launch in then to the history and some important points about universal service. <clears throat> so we've always had universal service um, efforts of one kind or another. Um, the first place that anybody paid any attention to trying to expand the networks really was in electricity. And um, outfits like the Washington Electric Co-op um, did a lot to you know, bring the electricity up in the hills where uh, the local uh, investor on utility had not, had not yet accomplished. And um, little by little during the middle of the 20th century, the concept of universal service got expanded to telephone and pretty soon the FCC got in the, in the game and started publishing data. And you could see over the course of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, there was an ever inclining <coughs> percentage of um, people who are of people who had telephones in their houses and who had access to telephones. But it was all based on the landline telephone. And uh, as you know, landline is now a distinct minority of, of uh, access lines. So a lot of what went on back then has, has changed fundamentally. Um, what, we, what we did at first was we did something called rate averaging. The cost of providing telephone service and electric service in rural areas is much, much higher than it is in towns and villages and cities where the average uh, distance between customers in, a, in Burlington might be 80 or 100 feet. Um, in rural parts of Vermont, it could be miles or at least portions, major portions of miles between houses. And that means that there's a lot of cable that has to be dedicated just to serve one customer. And what we did is we, we pretty much, with some minor exceptions, we pretty much charged everybody the same rate, regardless of cost. And this was maybe the, the power or the arrogance of regulation. You know, we set rates based upon what's fair in our eyes and not necessarily on where the cost lay. And a lot of people criticize this mechanism as containing something called an implicit subsidy, which is that even though the rates are the same, some people are paying more than their costs, others are paying less than their costs. In the, in, the, um, <clears throat> in the 70s and in the 80s, the FCC did a lot to revise the intercarrier payments that it was uh, largely in charge of. And every time it would revise um, or reduce a charge that particularly those that were paid to small carriers, it sort of created a new mechanism and it started creating these explicit universal service funds. And they, they turned the money over to be collected by a carrier association called NECA. Um, but there was, there was basically by the time Ike sort of came on the scene in 1990, there were two distinct subsystems of uh, support. One, it was, sadly, it was really organized around the lobbying groups more than it was around the needs of the, of the countryside. There was a support system for the large carriers and there was a different system for the small carriers. And small, you know what this means in your, in your state of Vermont. <clears throat> the large carrier was, the only large carrier we had was the Bell carrier, no one telephone. And all the other, I think it was nine companies were considered small carriers. And the latter group, the small carriers, had a much more generous system of support. And the problem in Vermont that I saw was that um, we were organized in a way such that it, had, it was really an historical accident. It was true in, in all up and down the East Coast. Most of our rural areas were served by the Bell Company. We had, uh, as I said, nine small carriers, but they really had a minority of rural lines. So they were doing quite well with this generous small carrier support system, and they could expand their networks and receive generous federal subsidies, uh, so-called interstate subsidies, um, to support that. And but but Verizon, uh, New England Telephone, 9X, Bell Atlantic, Verizon um, was unable to get that funding. So one of the things I did in my career in the board was on the joint board 
on the federal state joint board was to advocate for increased support <clears throat> to uh, New England Telephone. And for a while, we got a little bit more. But the problem, the political problem, was that the big companies, all of their executives lived in New York and Philadelphia and places like that. And they just didn't want to pay. And so the large company politically was opposed to support to large companies. And uh, it was, became sort of an insuperable problem. Um, I also want to spend a minute talking about regulatory jurisdiction. Is the committee familiar with the, where the concept of intrastate and interstate came from and where it stands right now? Or would I, a few minutes on that be useful? So I'll speak for the chair. Uh, it would be helpful to, to have a little bit of that. Okay. So um, early in the 20th century, um, there were some court decisions. I, I don't know if you guys, are, any of you are lawyers, but um, lawyers for a long time were really into uh, the Commerce Clause and the extent of the Commerce Clause and a lot of what happened in the Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt years was about construing the extent of the Commerce Clause and so the courts were really into this question of what is the federal the extent of the federal power and um, there were some early decisions in the early 20th century which said that you couldn't charge one group for the expenses incurred for the other group. And the groups were the people who used the network for in-state calling and the people who used the network for out-of-state calling. And so Telecom developed this really kind of bizarre <coughs> artifice that um, created, that divided each telephone company into two virtual companies. <coughs> there was an intrastate company and an interstate company. And each had, each company, uh, a pseudo company had a set of costs and it had a set of rates that it could use to recover those costs. So local exchange rates were intrastate and as was in-state toll calling. Most of you are probably old enough to remember the toll calling. Uh, and the federal jurisdiction was primarily um, interstate toll calling but also something called special access. So each sort of side had its own set of costs. Each side had its own uh, set of, of revenues. And um, regulators, I, regulators sort of remind me, to some extent, of the old joke in the New Yorker about, if you ever see the joke where the cartoon where they have a picture of the United States and Manhattan is like three quarters of the map, and then there's the Hudson River, and then there's New Jersey, and then the next comes California. Well, Regulators are sort of like that about jurisdiction. They think everything sort of ought to be divided according to the regulatory jurisdiction model. And uh, that's important in universal services, I'll explain in a minute. Um, there was some um, effort at um, pooling among telephone companies. As I mentioned, the feds had created some support for the rural companies <clears throat> and that they Funds have been collected and distributed by an, uh, an industry group, NECA. Now, in Vermont, we did that too for a while when we first adopted the Lifeline program in the, I'm going to say, the early 80s. Um, the funds were, not everybody, not every company had the same percentage of people getting Lifeline support. And so all of the funds were being collected sort of uniformly, but they weren't being distributed uniformly. So they needed to set up a pool to distribute the burden more equally. And um, they set it up again using the federal model. They used the Vermont Telephone Association to collect and distribute those funds. <clears throat> and uh, around the 1990s, it became apparent that um, the technology was changing, the attitudes about the uh, monopolies were changing, and everybody knew that local exchange monopolies were going to be broken up. And it took a few years, but um, finally, the, in 1996, the, FC, the, the Congress passed the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and mandated local exchange competition. And this, <clears throat> this made, um, insecure all of the implicit subsidies that we had been relying on to keep rural rates low. Uh, and the, the concept 
game currency that we needed to create explicit subsidies. Well, eventually the FCC did a lot of that work and they continued it until quite recently. They're still really reducing rates that they consider an excessive cost. <clears throat> but in Vermont, we were a little bit more cautious. We knew that this stuff was coming, but maybe we weren't quite ready. But then along comes the E911 technology, and they, the legislature quite reasonably decides that promoting our 911 program up to an E911 program was a timely thing to do, but they needed a source of funds. So we merged the two things. The E911 program sort of gave it the motive force. We had to get some funding for that, but we also said, well, we have this, this need for universal service coming down the road to generate explicit subsidies that will replace implicit subsidies. So why don't we just create a fund that could do all of this stuff at once, have one revenue source. We'll give it to a private company to be the fiscal agent for us, but it'll be mandated by state law. So that's what happened in 1984. We created the fund. Um, we set up priorities for funding different components of the, of the distribution program. And, uh, and E911 was off and running, I think, in October of 94. Um, and uh, the, the high cost portion of it was reserved for a future day. And I know that you have <coughs> since then created some high cost funds. Um, I have some observations about the collection uh, mechanism that we chose back then. Um, we used retail telecommunication service, and we used the state law definition of that. And I strongly advocated and still feel it's important that because the state of Vermont is exercising its taxing power, it should consider itself free to define terms in its tax laws as it wishes, and that you aren't necessarily bound by line drawing that happens at the FCC as to term what the meaning of terms is in federal law. Um, it's important also to realize that we, we uh, had a very limited concept of how many companies would be involved in this. We had, you know, a dozen companies, roughly, uh, reporting the first year or two. They were all telephone companies plus a few um, uh, long-distance companies like MCI. <coughs> and, uh, but it was only on retail, of course, you don't want to surcharge wholesale because then you'll discriminate against um, anybody who's providing a sort of middle level service uh, that feeds into a retail service. Um, we uh, applied the surcharge to both regulatory jurisdictions, the intrastate and the interstate. And this was um, somewhat controversial in Vermont, but enormously controversial later in, at the federal level and in other states. Um, I had found a Supreme Court case from a few years before that sustained the Illinois sales tax, which had been applied to both intrastate and interstate. And uh, on that basis, I advised the Commerce Committee that Vermont could apply the universal service charge to both intra and interstate sales. We were almost the only ones who did that. Um, two years later when the FCC got, or when the Congress passed the 96 Act, um, everybody agreed that the new interstate, the new FCC surcharges <clears throat> would be only on the interstate portion. And uh, most states that enacted universal service charges after us, so we were really almost almost the first. Um, most states well, went the same way that the Congress went and applied their surcharges only to the intrastate portion. Um, in retrospect, I, I think this is my opinion now, but uh, I think we did exactly the right thing. Um, the, the distinction between interstate and intrastate was always somewhat artificial. Um, there were lots of sort of rules of thumb that were applied. You know, if you're a wireless carrier, you do it this way. If you're selling special access, you do it that way. <coughs> and um, so it was never really 
anything but an artificial construction, but now it's an irrelevant artificial construction because, you know, people don't really keep track of their packets. They don't, some of the carriers claim that they can keep track of, of where calls originate and terminate, but a lot of those claims are really suspect. And, uh, you know, people, most people now just buy a bundle uh, of service that includes toll service nationwide and to Canada. <clears throat> and there's no longer, we're long past the days, I think, where most of us are paying, you know, more per minute to call Burlington than we are to call Los Angeles, which, which was a thing once upon a time. Uh, so I, I, you know, once again commend your predecessors for having made what I think in retrospect would be a wise decision to exert your taxing authority over without regard to the uh, regulatory jurisdiction of the service. Um, I have a couple of thoughts about spending uh, universal service funds. Um, there's uh, a, uh, there was always a distinction in our minds between PSAPs and dispatch. PSAPs, as you know, are the places that get the initial call from a, a 911 call. And then the PSAP has to hand the call off to the proper fire or medical or police agency to send a responder. And um, we, at the time, we felt it was important to maintain the distinction between the two. It was partly practical because you couldn't really know. At a, we only had two PSAPs in the beginning. You couldn't really know in Williston you know, what was going on in East Orleans, whether the fire chief was on vacation or not. And so there was a lot of sort of local knowledge that was necessary for effective dispatch. But the other problem, the contrasting problem was that <clears throat> peace outs are expensive. You have to train the people, you have to have the right equipment, you have to buy the electricity and, and the, the, the circuits, and you have to keep people there 24-7. So it's a lot of people and a lot of equipment. And uh, very few, in the beginning, very few cities wanted to stand up and say, we'll take a piece out here and we'll incur the cost. So it was always a, sort of a partly a practical, partly a financial uh, decision to keep them apart. But the other thing that was felt to be really important was that the committees back then didn't want telephone monies surcharges on telephone service to be used for other purposes than to make telephone available. And dispatch was considered to be more a police service than it was a telephone service. It was a somewhat artificial distinction, and it's been hard to, I understand it's been hard to maintain, and you're, you know, a lot's happened since I knew anything about it. But I just wanted you to know that history. <coughs> Maybe I'll pause and, and get my breath and ask if anybody has any questions at this point. I'm, I'm thinking I'm about halfway through. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah we, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, go ahead, Robin. Uh, good morning, Peter. This is uh, Robin Chestnut Tangerman. Hi, Robin. Nice to speak with you. Yeah, um, same here. So I'm intrigued by you talking about uh, the decision to um, tax interstate as well as intrastate calls. Yeah. And, uh, and that the distinction between the two being somewhat meaningless at this point. And I'm extending my, so my question is about does that same distinction apply to um, telephone services over broadband? And the ability well, um, to tax them. Uh, yeah, in, my, in the later part of my talk, I was going to, I might as well go into it now. Um, I do think that there's a sort of a tail wagging the dog problem here now. With, um, the, the network has evolved so that the really big thing on the network is, is broadband, is packets. Even the old TDM so called network is now mostly been packetized. They, actually, they had packets long before the internet came along, but nobody seemed to think that was important from a regulatory point of view. But it's very clear now that IP traffic is much bigger than voice traffic. And, um, you know, if you watch, uh, you know, an hour on streaming uh, Netflix, you're getting more bits into your television than you could probably spend in a month on talking on the phone. So 
what, what you have is the situation of um, telephone customers paying into the universal service fund that is being used primarily to extend broadband. And that's, a, that's maybe a good deal for some people, but it's a terrible thing for the urban customer who's imposing low costs on their telephone company who's still got pretty much rate average, average rates and who uh, maybe can't afford broadband or doesn't have good broadband you know, at his house. So there's a sort of a mis mismatch between the people, I think, between the people who are paying and the people who are benefiting. In many, many cases, they're the same people, but there are, there will be circumstances where someone is in one category or the other. And it, it seems, it seems uh, also increasingly sort of artificial to um, exclude broadband. This, it has happened at the federal level. They, they go through a lot of machinations down at the FCC to include and exclude certain things from um, information services. And it reminds me of nothing so much as scholastic philosophy. You know, it's, oh, it's more of this than it, the essence of it is that. And, and uh, but what they have done is they have excluded broadband for their purposes. And the result is they have an ever declining revenue base. If you look at the, uh, on the website of um, the Universal Service Administrative Company, USAC, you can find that their the trend of interstate chargeable telecommunications revenues has been constantly down for a number of years. <clears throat> it partly it's due to the administ poor administration, I think, but partly it's just due to the fact that telephone is accounting for less and less of the network. And if you want something, if you want a, if you want a fund that is capable of supporting expansion of the network into rural areas, I think it's reasonable to say you should look at the revenues from the network to pay for it. And, and Peter, can I can I interject a, yeah. a question here? Um, yeah. uh, I don't know if you have visibility kind of nationally, um, uh, but what is the um, for other states who have universal service funds um, to the extent that they um, very specifically reach into kind of the VoIP uh, kind of model to. To yeah. assess, um, you know, kind of a USF, which we do in Vermont, but I, yeah. um, you know, Robin, I'm sorry, I haven't really researched that. I, I, um, I know that there have been cases. Uh, my business partner Bob Lowe was involved in a case, I think, in Minnesota, which I think did not come out well uh, from my point of view or his point of view. And uh, we could perhaps research that for you, or you could, you know, ask your lawyer to look it up. There, I understand there was an appeals court decision from Minnesota, but I, I haven't read the decision. Um, and uh, so uh, I, I'm sorry, I can, I'm not really prepared to fully answer your question. It, it sounds like that's an evolving uh, area. It's an evolving area, and it's legally perilous. I mean, uh, there's very little that's clear, and um, you'll hear all sorts of, you know, people with great assurance telling you it'll go one way or the other, but uh, I'm not sure anybody really knows. Uh, but I, I would want to do more research before I really gave you an opinion. Yeah. Um, Peter, we have another question for you. Yeah. Yeah, this is Representative Mike Antochka. Um, you were talking about the case with uh, Illinois applying yeah. the USF yeah. uh, sales tax, I guess it was, right, to interstate and interstate. Uh, how broad was that decision? Does it apply to the state's taxing authority in all areas? You know, uh, it's been a number of years since I read it. As I remember, um, the court uh, talked about what the elements were for a constitutionally acceptable sales tax. Now, we're not talking here about a sales tax that's prohibited by a federal statute. We're just talking about something that may or may not be in conflict with the U.S. Constitution and the Commerce Clause. And the court outlined some minimum requirements. For example, you can't apply a sales tax to something that's already been taxed by another state's sales tax. You have to give a credit for sales taxes paid elsewhere. 
the law does that, every state does that. So the things that were constitutionally required were already working on the Vermont sales tax and we built them into the BUSF. I think you'll find there's a section in the original BUSF, probably still there, that says if you pay a similar tax, a similar charge in another state, you get to deduct it from the, your payments to the fiscal agent. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, actually I was thinking about how it might apply to other areas. For instance, uh, uh, applying a, uh, um, a fee to uh, energy that's sold out of state. Oh boy, that, that and, really is and I want, I, If you're not an expert in that, I don't expect an answer, but I was just uh, wondering, do you, do you happen to yeah. know what the case was uh, that you were referring to? Illinois versus... I can, I can send I can send your uh, your committee assistant the, the case. I don't okay. remember it offhand, but I can I can look it up easily enough. Okay, thank and, you. Uh, I think I think you might have trouble with that. I think there there has to be um, it, that would be an export tax, and um, so you you're talking about energy that you generate in Vermont, but that's sold out sold to someone out of state. Right. Um, I think the courts, this is really reaching way, way back, but I think you'll find that the courts are very uh, critical of anything that, in, that involves tax and exports. Okay. Um, okay. All right, That's thank all you. That's all I know. That's maybe more than I know. <laughs> <laughs> that never stops us. <laughs> Uh, what do we want to do, Mr. Chairman? Um, well, so we've got a, you know another uh, 10 to 15 minutes of your okay. time, and I, I don't okay. know if you want to you know kind of focus on a few more things that you wanted to share with us, and we can jump in with questions. Hopefully, not taking us too far off that. Sure. Well, I think I talked about the dispatch. Um, the next area I wanted to discuss was uh, spending USF funds on wireless. Um, most people have cell phones. Everybody, just about, even my grandson has a cell phone. Uh, and a lot of people have given up their landline phones. And uh, so the number of wireless phones is quite a bit larger than the number of landline phones now. Um, and, uh, but Vermont, uh, I do want to commend the department for having Corey Chase drive around with his little <laughs> box of cell phones and making maps. Uh, I, you guys know about that they did that? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's more than anybody did before, and uh, I think it's commendable. And uh, But it's, there's still gaps, apparently. And uh, so you had this, for a while, you had this thing called the microcell network going, and I guess it fell apart recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the equipment, apparently somebody in the state bought 400 microcells and about 100 of them more or less are now up on poles and they're dark. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't clear that they had a, uh, a viable um, business plan. They were, they were incurring a lot of costs for, uh, for power, they were incurring a lot of costs for interconnections, they're incurring a lot of costs from the FCC for, um, for the, the uh, ability to locate signals for 911 purposes. And some of those costs could be reduced possibly. Um, but I, th I think you might want to consider whether uh, a reasonable use for Vermont Universal Service Fund is to expand the network of cell sites, uh, either using microcells or something else, so that more rural areas get cell service. It's a, you know, it's important for people who are driving and get off the road during a snowstorm, or somebody's up in the woods and cuts himself with his chainsaw and has a cell phone. Um, having wireless service is just about everywhere. It could be really valuable. And uh, so I think it's an appropriate application for USF funds. Uh, the particulars of this microcell network are a little troubling. Um, you know, it's 2G technology, and they're, now we're, we're mostly going to be at 4G with some urban areas at 5G. So it's not the latest and the greatest technology, but it's cheap, it's on hand, there's some cost. They have 
quite a number of these things. And um, if you put them up and you get them running on a pay-as-you-go basis uh, so they can support themselves, they would be able in the future to be upgraded to 4G uh, quality. And uh, I think it would be you know, a small sort of first step. The only caution I would have is that <clears throat> there's a, a fundamental rule of economics that the Congress and the FCC don't seem to understand, which is competition is great in urban areas um, where there's some sort of profit and cream to skim from overcharging incumbents. But in rural areas, it's hard to get the money together to build the first network, never mind the second and the third and the fourth network by competitors. And that's why it's been so hard to get universal service out to rural areas, because the FCC has been devoted to this sort of competition model and you know, let private industry solve it. Well, my recommendation is not that you, you know, have the state own these things and operate them, but I do think that they should operate on a set of rules in which the operator of the microcells is a neutral party and is not using the microcell to extend a proprietary network such as that owned by AT&T or Verizon. So the concept here is that they should be operated by a neutral host. And I don't know enough about what the Department of Public Service has out there in the way of you know, bid solicitations, but that would be a, a question that I would be asking them if I were to talk with them about this, this project. Um, I'll move on unless there are any questions about that. Um, the, uh, the next topic is that I wanted to talk about is E911 and IP integration. Um, I've read the reliability report from the E911 board and uh, I'm a little surprised that 25 years into the program, the elements that were put in place in the early, in the mid-90s <coughs> are really still there and they're still costing us apparently a fair amount of money. Um, they still rely on um, so-called special access point-to-point -point circuits between the um, telephone uh, central offices and the so-called tandem, the, the 911 tandem where all the calls are funneled. And uh, I, I don't have the number for the cost of this, but I, I'm surprised that they would still be using special access because special access is something that has been um, pretty much, uh, the, the telephone companies have a lot of market power in setting their uh, special access rates. And it's been traditionally a very important uh, and very strongly protected uh, product line for them, and they vehemently oppose any sort of efforts at the federal level to reduce rates for special access. So I'm assuming that the 911 folks are still paying a lot for these circuits, and there's a lot. There are a lot of options, <coughs> and uh, it comes up not only just in terms of cost, but also in terms of reliability. Excuse me. <coughs> um, I understand that Vermont has had cases recently where so-called remote switches have been isolated. Um, I don't want to go into the, te the technical stuff now in a short time, but if there's a break in the circuit between a, a remote switch in a rural area and its host switch, um, E911 service can be disrupted for quite a while. And it seems to me that there could be, if, if the E911 board were willing to sort of break apart this sort of turnkey contract it has asked for and consider the possibility that the 911 people might go into the central offices of the telephone companies, use the acts of the legal access that the Congress gave them in 1996 and maybe put a piece of equipment in that <clears throat> on a failover basis connects the 911 call to the internet or to a, a cellular tower. Um, they could solve this remote switch isolation problem, and they could probably reduce costs and buy less um, special access circuits. So that's, that's uh, any questions on that? Uh, 
I'm almost sure yeah. here. I <laughs> don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, our outages are a problem <laughs> now in the, in the current network. They're much, much worse a problem than it was in the old days when telephones ran on power from the central office. The central office had a big generator and lots of diesel oil in the tank. Uh, Almost every piece of equipment now that's not in the in the central office has to have batteries now, and this includes so-called remote platforms that are in many neighborhoods. When they started, you know, with, uh, putting in remote platforms, they could push DSL farther and farther out into the into the sticks, and um, so those things they run on on electric power, and when electric power goes out, they have batteries that last for a while, and then. Somebody has to go and rent, arrive in a truck with a generator and charge up the batteries again. And there's often the problem that there aren't enough trucks <clears throat> when there aren't enough generators. And um, <clears throat> same thing for cell power, the same thing for the, uh, the devices that the cable companies use. It's even true for your phone in your home. The phone I'm talking to you on is, is a cordless phone and uh, it's got batteries in it. And if I lose electric power 24 hours from now, this phone won't work. Um, so maybe one of the things your committee might want to look at is is, uh, is Vermont doing enough to ensure that battery backups are at least available, if not required, um, for uh, all the different ways of getting telephone service. Uh, finally, my comments. I have some comments about extending the, the broadband network. I, I see that you have a very <coughs> ambitious. And I shouldn't say very ambitious, quite a stretch goal for 2024 of 100 megabits both directions. And, uh, but I also see that you have only five years left. And uh, I think you're going to have to uh, move into a higher gear if you're going to try to really reach that. Um, your Vermont Universal Service Fund is awarding support to companies that provide four megabits uh, down and one megabit up. On the downside, that's 1 20th of your goal, and on the upside, it's 1 100th of your goal. So I think I would suggest that you maybe spend some committee time, if you have it, um, talking about what a real uh, plan to get to 100, 105 years might look like. And finally, uh, oh no, I'm not finally, not almost finally. Uh, I want to suggest an open market for middle mile fiber. Um, the, the 96 Act, when it was passed, imagined a situation where prices were available for all sorts of things in the telephone network. Um, competitors were going to come in, they were going to sign interconnection agreements, they were going to be filed with state commissions. The next competitor could come and look at the last competitor's uh, interconnection agreement and use it as a basis for opening negotiations. Uh, the concept was that competition can work to drive down prices, and if it works, we can eliminate regulation, but we have to have an open market. We have to be able to know what the prices are, what the conditions are for interconnection. I don't think much of that is true of your dark fiber market. A lot of people in Vermont apparently have built fiber over the years, and uh, there's nobody that you can go to to say, you know, if I want to transport a signal from point A to point B, who's got fiber there and what do they charge? So yeah. you might consider whether me. developing Excuse such oh, a thing uh, would Excuse be useful. Me. I'm pretty sure it would be useful. I don't know what it would cost you to do it. <clears throat> Peter, me, can we Peter. get a question in? Question, go ahead. Yeah, Peter, why are you under the impression that there is no one that you can talk to, of, uh, that you can ask where uh, fiber exists in the state? Well, I know that you can find out where some fiber is. The state has listed its, um, it, where its uh, fiber is and its, its uh, towers and such. But I don't, I don't believe that there's any place you can go, for example, to find out where VTEL's fiber is or what they charge um, for it. And I know that there are a lot of other companies that have laid fiber in Vermont. Like, like? I could be wrong. I, I just, oh, okay. I'm just not aware of any place. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. No, I said thank you. Okay. Um, anyway, I, I think it's technically possible to establish a database 
for this service, and uh, I think it would produce some cost savings that might be useful for the E911 people. Uh, but it, there is some uh, risk that federal law might might complicate your effort to establish it because they've gotten they've really used the federal or the industry has used the federal law to um, as a shield against state regulation. I see I've only got a minute left, but I'll I'll say that. Uh, I do have some ideas about spending USF funds on broadband. I think you should make sure that whatever mechanism you, you develop should be efficient in the sense that it doesn't give funds to providers that don't need the funds. And I think it should be effective in the sense that it should accomplish something that wouldn't otherwise be accomplished. And that, that was actually the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Sorry, I can hardly hear. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay. We feel like we I'll used up most. Of, we feel like we used most of your voice up uh, in your 45 minutes as well. So, uh, <laughs> so thanks for your time. All right. Very good. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you. Two ways and needs. So, just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Jeremy, welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. No. So, thank you for being here a few minutes early. We're, we've got a a busy morning and, and appreciate you being able to join us. No worries. Us. I will try to be as brief as possible. Um, you have my, um, yeah, my my printed statements too, I believe. Okay. If, if it made it to you. Not, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, for the record, I'm uh, Jeremy Hansen. Um, I'm the chair of CV Fiber Communications Union District, serving soon to be 17 towns in Washington, Orange, and Lamoille counties. I'm also an associate professor of computer science at Norwich University. I'm also the vice chair of the Berlin Select Board. <coughs> um, so there's uh, really two distinct goals that we're talking about when we talk about making broadband better in Vermont. And it's, I think it's important to make sure we keep in mind which one we're talking about, which, um, you know, which, which goal we're seeking as these different um, policy pushes that we're looking at here um, are pursued. So number one is improving broadband to more like 21st century speeds. So that's um, applications that can support um, modern computer applications, not just everything that we've been able to do with our computers so far. So, and improving broadband to those speeds for large swaths of Vermonters. Uh, number two is bringing adequate broadband, so something, something being better, better than nothing, to those last few Vermonters who are unserved or are really profoundly underserved. Um, <clears throat> and before I so, sort of dive into, some, into the specifics of the, the bills that you have in front of you, um, I want to point out that the connectivity fund really supports goal number two. That's how do we get those last handful of people some service that's adequate where they have something. So they can get to their email, so they can get to um, you know uh, job boards, not necessarily so that they can stream anything high speed or do anything really er uh, earth shattering or new with it. Um, but the connectivity fund has been underfunded, which I'm uh, excited to see that you're taking steps to mitigate that. But honestly, it's not terribly helpful to CV Fiber at this point. The eligible addresses are um, not terribly densely packed. So for projects that we're looking at, it would not be helpful for us, I would say, in the first several years. That's not something that we're really going to be able to take advantage of. Just network engineering um, makes that difficult. So because our mission is to bring fiber to the premises throughout those soon to be 17 towns, um, those places that we're targeting do tend to be underserved in that they only, um, the, the folks that only have DSL that don't have cable or anything else, those are the folks we're most interested in serving first. That said, those that are defined by needing service by the connectivity fund, there's a handful here and there. And it's not, they're difficult to reach and don't really make sense in the, or the larger design of what we're imagining our network to look like. Um, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the, the connectivity fund has been in the past fairly cost ineffective. You've got a lot of money being plowed into these, you know, handful of people at the ends of dirt roads, but um, this money's going, in a lot of cases, to out-of-state for-profit corporations who are investing in more copper infrastructure, which I think you'll hopefully see a pattern in the testimony that I'm giving today that where I talk about this sort of... Um, reinvestment in archaic, obsolete uh, technologies that the money of the taxpayers of Vermont, I think, could be more wisely invested. So um, the goals of reaching everyone, 
give adequate broadband to everyone is certainly a laudable goal. It's really important. Um, and it's one I know that DPS, for example, strongly supports. Um, it's not something that's going to help CB fiber and new communications union districts get off the ground, just by the way that it's currently structured. In the short term, long term, yes, we will have, we will be looking at using that for completing portions of the network. But otherwise, but it's, it's so small, first of all, and it's really targeted at those people who have nothing. Um, it's not, uh, it's, it's not going to be helpful to us. However, um, there's additional language in H94, so this is on page three of the, the as introduced bill. Um, there's funds allocated for feasibility studies and technical assistance to municipalities. This is great. This will help us. This will help us get off the ground and get moving forward. Um, I do have a small sort of uh, nitpicky request. Um, if the language could be changed so that those of us who already have created a communications union district, if we can make so that we would be eligible for that as well. Um, the language says two municipalities in the process of developing a communications union district. For us, that process is, is past, I, I think. Um, so if we could change that to existing communications union districts or on the next line in my testimony there to just simply say just two municipalities. Can I just ask a uh, so, Jeremy, when you're um, imagining feasibility studies and you're developing, you, you have the district, mm -hmm. um, but it's a large district with a lot of towns, are you doing a single feasibility study? Are you doing a feasibility study for an individual municipality in your district? Are you doing it for several? How do you envision that happening? That, so that's a good question. There are going to be feasibility studies throughout our our lifespan. I mean, so the, yeah. our initial feasibility study that we're looking at is you know, putting out a survey, gathering data, looking for where it makes most sense for us to start. Okay. And that feasibility study should give us a sense of what the economics, what the take rate of those different places where we might start building so for that we, small project. So we're, we're going to survey our entire district. First. First. And we will have hopefully some good data there, but that, that gets us to a certain point so that we can get into our pilot project hopefully by the end of the year. But later, when we go to build the next part, we will probably have to do um, more studies. We'll have to then resurvey people or look at where um, um, what might make sense to, to build next. Because we're necessarily small, because we're cash strapped, we're trying to think of what are the ways that we can do this on a shoestring, because that's really all we have, um, is just to keep this simple, target this at one specific narrow five or six miles of fiber, and we're gonna have to go back and I don't want to say start over. We will have a lot of the, we'll have the business plan. We'll have a lot of the economics solid, but we will need to go back and do more um, and do another study of some sort to decide about our next steps and subsequent steps. Planning. Planning. Exactly. That's probably a better, better. Um, umbrella to describe there. Study is not a beloved word in this building. <laughs> no, it's that's something you do in the summer, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, this, it wasn't a bill that you wanted me to comment on, but I wanted to use uh, H96 to illustrate a point um, in H160, which I'll get into a bit more. Um, H96 has a, <coughs> uh, a requirement, or a, proposed to add a requirement of the process of bypassing Act 250 and local control for telecommunications projects, but the minimum threshold that it sets is really, really painfully low. Uh, so it says at 4 megabits per second down and 1 megabit per second up. And so this incentive makes sense. You want to make sure that there's uh, there's kind of a minimum uh, minimum threshold for what would what kind of project would justify this this waiver. Um, modern wireless communications you can go easily ten times faster than that. Sometimes even more, depending. And that's only getting better. So saying you want to you want to make sure that they're providing this at four meg down or one meg up. If you're going to give them a way to get to to if you're going to give telecommunications companies the ability to get out of the Act 250 and some and the local process, why not make it so that they have to have to reach something that's actually going to be uh, usable? I mean, and I, I don't want to mince words about it, but um, looking a bit farther into the future, if we're going to ask for slow, we're going to get slow. So you say we want 4.1, you're going to get 4.1, which right now is is not adequate. I mean, it gets to those people who are that last the last person at the end of the dirt road, and it's, it's okay, but it's not most modern, most modern internet applications. So, segueing then into H160. So your question, yeah. what, what would your recommendation be, 25, 3, or? Nope, I want, I'm, if we're gonna build real 
telecommunications infrastructure in Vermont, it should be 100 symmetric. I mean, it's in 30 VSA 202C, and that says, that it's in statute, it says by 2024, we're sh we should have everyone connected with 100 meg up and 100 meg down. When that may not be reasonable for wireless sites, but on the other hand, we should be asking for way more than four. Um, and that's and that's that literally what I'm what I'm getting to next. Yeah. No, I was going to say, uh, is that is 100 100 uh, uh, threshold or a goal? Um, I, mean, I, do, I don't have. Wait, do I still have the language in front of me? So it says um, support measures designed to ensure that by the end of the year 2024, every E911 business and residential location in Vermont has infrastructure capable of delivering internet access with service that has a minimum download speed of 100 megabits per second is symmetrical, up and down. Right, that, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as H96 is concerned, you're, you're saying that uh, put the threshold at 100, 100? I, I, don't, I don't know that that's reasonable. That, that's what I was ask, asking. Uh, and I think uh, Representative Pigley's uh, question as to uh, <coughs> the recommendation on, on changing that from 401 to to what, 25.3 or 25 symmetrical or what? It's, it's something it, like that. It's, it's better. I mean, I mean, if, if, if we're going to, again, if we're going to build 21st century infrastructure, why are we building 1990s infrastructure? Is, is anything capable of delivering 25 symmetrical, capable of delivering 100 symmetrical? Um, with uh, fiber, most certainly is. Cable can, cable can deliver 25.3, and there are wireless um, technologies in the 4G umbrella of technologies that can certainly certainly deliver 25 and some of them just depending on how they're sited and how they're built can deliver 100 as well the symmetric is maybe yeah. okay <clears throat> thank you um, Jeremy, my impression is that the lifespan of, of copper infrastructure is 30 years or so that's how it's usually depreciated and uh, and for fiber it's more like 50 De it depends on the technology, but I would say that that's reasonably accurate. Yeah. So the, I mean, where I'm going with this is, I think the idea of, you know, okay, so we'll build four one to somebody who has nothing because it's better than nothing, as a bridge. But it, we're talking about a thirty year bridge, in which there's then no incentive to. Is it a bridge to nowhere? Right. I mean, is you know, is there going to be some guarantee that then that person once they have four one, I mean, so that's. That's the modern day equivalent of, I mean, dial up is still out there, don't get me wrong, but 4 1 right now is the modern day equivalent of dial up. If you sort of like, walk back in time about 10 years, it's, it's not adequate. And, and I don't know that you need to answer this now, but this is a question I'm really struggling with. So, how do we ensure if, if we raise these speeds, which I think there's a, you know, an excellent case to do so, how do we ensure that? that does not refocus the discussion on the centers that are served and continue to leave the last mile unserved or underserved. And in my mind, that is in an increasing vulnerability. EC Fiber is building out fiber wall to wall in all of their territories, mm -hmm. including those folks that are, that are eligible for funding through the connectivity initiative, including uh, they're not using wireless, but including those that would be eligible under H96 for this bypassing of the Act 250 process. So it's possible. It's economical. It's different than how this stuff has been incentivized before. So if you want us to be building fiber, incentivizing us building fiber would probably make a good, I would say that would make a good policy statement. Um, Okay. H-160 uh, allows for municipalities to issue general obligation bonds to help construct a communications plant with a minimum speed of 10 down and 1 up. And this is something that, um, as I understand it, EC Fiber is not a fan of allowing towns to uh, issue general obligation bonds for this purpose. Um, so I'm going I'm to come back to that, but <clears throat> again, 10 down, 1 up, is that's something that I arguably get with my service, with my DSL service at home. Um, that's more like the advertised speed, and I basically never get it. I really, honestly, where I am right now, even with that, the higher end DSL connection I have, I, I can't watch Netflix anymore when the weather's bad. I can't do work. I can't do remote work. To, um, you know, submitting videos to my students 
when I record video lectures, I can't submit those to my students unless I drive back down to Northfield and upload them from the campus network. Uh, I'm a computer scientist, so I'm sort of, maybe I'm spoiled about this, but you know, when somebody sends me a 23 second video of their dog playing in a Vermont river and say, hey, look at this, haha, you know, cat videos, right? They send me this video and it takes me 10 minutes to download, okay? 10.1 is advertised speed. 10.1 you never get. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not gonna mince words, I'm just gonna, just gonna tell it to you like this. If we want to incentivize modern infrastructure, let's align this with 100, 100. And H160 can, if you want it to, say, if municipalities are going to issue general obligation bonds, which is this thing that maybe is a good idea, maybe not a good idea, let's have it. Let's have in, people invest in stuff that's going to last and that's going to provide actual 21st century speeds. Um, that was, there's no cutting corners. There's no installing technology that's already obsolete. There's no more stringing additional copper um, on the poles that are out there. And then to address the concern about um, making people reluctant to form a CUD because of the possibility of general obligation bonds. As I was talking to all of the various select boards in the, uh, in the 17 towns, um, it came up about, you know, they were, people really were, um, really appreciated the fact that there was this financial firewall between, sorry, the technical term, between the, um, between the district and the municipalities. That said, I also had folks in municipalities come up to me and say, how can the city or town, how can we invest? And I have to tell them, you can't. That's not, that's not really, unless you are contracting with us to do a particular project, that's not really something that you can do. Um, but as I understand it, I expect that if they're issuing general obligation bonds, that still has to go in front of the voters. So the voters of each town would presumably have a chance to say, I don't want my taxes to pay for this or I do want my taxes to pay for this. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that that's as big of a problem as EC Fiber has said. This is one of those, one of those small places where I think CV Fiber and EC Fiber might you know, diverge in opinion a little bit. And that could just be because of where we are. I mean, they are cash flow positive. We, are, we have a bank account of donations right now. So we're a bit earlier in the process. Uh, H160 also designates the Think Vermont Innovation Fund to help provide technical assistance grants to Vermont, com Vermont communities planning broadband projects. This is, this is great. This is super important. We get back to this technical assistance or planning idea and making the, the, these resources available to us. That will help us get off, get off the ground. Super important. Um, there's language in there that says that it's offered to communities. And I would just suggest just for um, picky details sake that we replace that with municipalities because arguably the communications union district is not a community it's a municipality and so uh, here's me being a broken record H160 establishes the broadband expansion loan program we love this CV fiber would definitely want to partner with the state with this and hope that if this passes we will be engaging with the state in this as soon as possible um, but you say the minimum is 25 down three up we're going to build modern broadband infrastructure. It ought to align with what our stated statutory goals are of 100, 100. That's on page 8 of page 160 as introduced. So um, summing it all up, um, we have the chance to build up broadband right to bring it to everybody, literally everybody. And we can, but we can leapfrog these 1990s era technologies. And we can do that on a statewide scale. But it really requires us to be a little bit more ambitious on setting our um, Kind of minimum standards, those minimum goals for the whole um, span of bills that you have in front of you today. So, Jeremy, a question on um, the uh, the point you raised with regard to the broadband expansion um, loan program, and this may flow through to some of the other um, points you made here with regard to what are the minimum standards that, that we should be holding ourselves to, and certainly state money going to support some <coughs> of these things. Um, uh, I'm an EC Fiber customer. Um, I have the capability of getting 100 to 100, or even faster, I think 700 to 700. Mm -hmm. um, I actually only get 25 3. Um, you get 25 25. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, you're yeah. right. I get 25 <laughs> 25. Um, so uh, I have the ability to get much faster. I choose to take only what I need. Sure. Um, uh, 
I just want to be clear that the point you're making here is the ability to get the ability, that, as right. opposed to um, what what people would actually be willing to take. I think actually not a lot of EC fiber customers actually take that highest level. Certainly the highest level. I, I think most take kind of twenty five three. Or yeah, and the the, the twenty five twenty five twenty five twenty five. It costs seventy four dollars, yeah. and the um, seven hundred seven hundred costs somewhere around like one hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. So if you average the how much all of their subscribers are paying. It's a little bit over a hundred dollars. So um, there's a spectrum of people who are, you know, there's a bunch of people certainly taking the, the that lower level. There's plenty of people taking higher levels as well. Yeah. So go ahead, Laura. And then you. And then I'm going to come back to me. Are you not finished? I'm not. You raise your hand third. That's what um, <laughs> So technology for 100. 100 is all um, of the technology that is available that we know of for 100. 100 is fiber. Um, cable, some of the more modern um, cable protocols can do this, um, and there are some uh, shorter range wireless that can do this as well. So could you potentially have a fiber fixed wireless program that could do this? Okay. Mm -hmm. So fiber, some of the more modern cable infrastructure, yep. and short range <coughs> wireless. Right. Yes. Yeah, and it's fixed wireless. Um, maybe, maybe not. I mean, um, okay. there, are, there are some 4G protocols, I don't know, that were, that are being used in Vermont that do support those higher speeds. Uh, 5G, there's definitely some that are being kind of touted under that umbrella of, of offering those speeds as well, and actually quite quite a lot faster than that. Is issues with 5G, I won't, I won't go into right now. We're not even trying to talk about it. It's all good. Yeah. I was just going to say that what we're talking about here is really building a minimum capacity of, of 100, 100, not that it has to be 100, 100 yep. everywhere. That's, 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 that's just going to go ahead for that word. Chairman, my, my question is, I learned a little bit yesterday, I believe, that um, I asked about uh, fiber versus cable. Mm -hmm. And it was said that you could run fiber from cable with certain technology. Is that correct? Um, Sure. I mean, you can run fiber from copper as well. I mean, it just okay. depends on how you kind of architect the network. So I guess my point there is if, if you have an area that's served by cable and it's being extended, are you saying also that extended with fiber, even though it may cost more to transfer it? Uh, I mean, so <clears throat> extending the network, again, there's this notion of middle mile, whether you're extending sort of that this backbone or whether you're extending the links to the individual houses. And even when we have cable infrastructure, a lot of the, that backbone, that middle mile, is actually already fiber. So look at Transvideo in Northfield. Their backbone in the village of Northfield is fiber. What they use to bring the, that last mile to the individual houses is cable. Doesn't have to be. Transvideo could string fiber to the individual residences and offer gigabit speeds. They have the capacity. It's just, it's just not, not their business model. Thanks. Um, so, Jeremy, the, uh, seems one, one of the critical factors of this is, um, you know, it's easy to do the build out, but the take up rate, mm -hmm. take rate. Um, and uh, so in driving costs down, you get the big upfront costs to make ready poles, and, and I'm wondering if you could comment on ways to drive those costs down. And on the other end, you have the individual drops to the houses, which are sometimes quick and easy, but on the long driveway can be really prohibitive. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm just, I mean, I'm thinking that people who live on the, on the end of the dirt road are often DIY people sure. who would be completely willing to bury a conduit themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and do you um, anticipate working with customers that way to drive down costs? Yeah, I mean, and as I understand it, the way EC Fiber does it, if it, they essentially say if the drop is any longer than 300 feet, the customer is essentially responsible for figuring out how they're going to do that, whether that's paying EC Fiber to pay the contractor to do that construction, or in some, in some real way for the, the customer to do that themselves. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's a possibility. There's also, you know, going back to Representative Higley's suggestion about uh, like hybrid technologies, you can also use short range wireless technologies. If you have somebody on the top of the hill and there's no poles to get there and it's all ledge and you're not really going to easily get a cable up there, it's perfectly possible to build a point to point wireless connection and give them awesome speeds. Um, that's not something that we're like planning on deploying widely, but it's something we've certainly talked about. So if you're far up there, we've got line of sight, maybe not always the case either, but if we can get line of sight and get a point-to-point -point wireless link, yeah, you can still you can still guarantee those speeds. That's possible. Okay. Yeah, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you take fiber off cable, you're still limited to whatever space the cable can uh, give you, right? Correct. Yeah. Which was on either end. Yeah, so, so if you imagine you have a big sewer main and it feeds into a smaller sewer main, there's, that's it's a choke point. I mean, it's only going to flow as fast as the smallest link in the, in the chain. So, the DOCSA switches the cable technology um, and twist and pair, which is the, the phone lines, can all go up to a gig. Um, it's just dependent on the distance. So, if if there is a facility that is really tough to get that last little bit, depending on how far it is from how far we can get the fiber. Um, it, it is possible to use that for the last connection and still have phenomenal service. So um, I guess a question would be, um, are you recommending language that specifies a particular transport medium or a particular no. speed? Speed. I mean, people don't care about the medium. Right. They just want to be able to watch their cat videos. <laughs> the internet is a series of tubes full of cats. There you go. So um, I, I want to dig in a little bit on the, um, uh, the, the part of your testimony at the top of the second page, which gets into the, kind of the geobond discussion. Mm -hmm. And um, we're getting um, various signals uh, on, on how, in fact, I would say even within the EC fiber community, we're getting uh, various, mm -hmm. we heard from Michael Birnbaum yesterday. And um, I just want to go through in some grand clarity <coughs> how, as you are kind of building your business model here, um, potentially adding additional towns to the, to the CUD, um, how you think about how this could be helpful to you, you know, where the potholes are. Um, you've outlined that a little bit here. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm thinking about this, in the, and, and this is something you said in your testimony, that towns should absolutely um, have the final say as to what they're putting their taxpayers I'm hoping for. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, maybe you've got a town that has joined your CUD. Um, that municipality, that CUD, decides at some point two years down the road, you know, um, general obligation bonds is, is a place that we should turn. At that point, does a town have the ability to say, we don't want to be part of the CUD anymore? Because of, I, I'm trying to think of, of um, just from a, a practical standpoint, how this works um, as you're kind of building the, the business model as you, as you move along. Sure. I mean, so you know, this notion of economies of scale yep. uh, doesn't, makes it very difficult. I was going to say it doesn't make sense, but it makes it very difficult for a single town to go it alone. That's yep. not to say that they can't. Yep. So, um, and we've heard testimony about this that, you know, when New Hampshire consolidated his work with the town. Of course. Um, that might not be possible here yet, but it may be with H160. And I, we haven't looked at that business model closely, but mm -hmm. it's something we're interested in. So, Sure. So it's, I mean, it's a possibility, but I mean, I'm, as a select board member, I'm, I'm also a fan of local control. And sure. if, the, if the town decides that the best way to have, to get those, those economic development benefits is building their own network, I, okay. Yeah. Then there's a procedure for them to leave the district, and that's, that's okay. We would hate to see them go. Right. Um, but on the other hand, I hear more about the town not wanting to have that responsibility and, and wanting it to work. But I have had towns in my district say, again, how can we help? You know, can we, can we do this? So Montpelier, for example, is a CUD member of both EC Fiber and CV Fiber. And there's a reason for that. It's because they, they're, they're almost 100% served by cable. And people are still chomping at the bit. Everyone I talk to in Montpelier, most people I talk to in Montpelier, still want fiber. Um, and I, I can understand why. And there might be more appetite in Montpelier to build something like that. I don't 
I don't get the sense, and this is you know, purely anecdotal, I don't get the sense that they would want to go it alone. Um, but I would, I mean, I guess I would support if they want to go it alone, then okay. If they're going to find it's much more expensive for them to do it solo than it is with a kind of our consortium of um, 17 towns. So with the consortium of 17 towns, um, I'm sure all of them don't agree. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's you know, a lot of different attitudes, particularly on something like geobonding. So um, what I'm trying to get my head around is, um, is there any place for geobonding when you've got a, a consortium of 17 towns, um, probably with a variety of different financial capabilities and demographics of perspective, you know, prospective subscribers to, uh, to fiber service? Is there any way to kind of bring that group around um, the, the idea of geobonding as something that works for this um, municipality that's been formed um, by these 17 towns, the CUD? Sure, I mean, it's going back to the Montpelier example. The reason that EC Fiber and the reason that CV Fiber, the reason that EC Fiber has not built in Montpelier to date, and the reason that CV Fiber right now is not really looking at Montpelier is it requires a different business model. The density is different, the take rate is different, competition is different. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of stuff already on the poles. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of buried lines. Yeah. So it's much more expensive. It's it's a different landscape. If Montpelier came out and said, hey, we want to invest in this as a municipal infrastructure project and we want you to manage this, we would say, okay, now we can look at the economics and it starts to look like that's something that we could do because that's not us chasing after how we're going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. They could partner with us and essentially contract with us to build them out. And I've, I've told folks in Montpelier and Barry City and Barry Town that have pretty pervasive amounts of cable like you're not really on our radar for the first couple of years, frankly, um, just because it's a it's a harder it's a, it's a harder situation. There's people in there's people in Roxbury and Elmore and Orange who will um, sign up in greater numbers, and even though we're this public entity, we still have to make the business case. We still have to pay our bills at the end of the month. There's still expectations that the business has to work. So we're going to go to the places where we can serve people, we can meet our mission, and we can make the numbers work. So one could look at geobonding authority as simply a, another tool in the toolkit for CUDs to find a financial um, modeling path to where you're trying to get to. Um, a concern that I have uh, that I'm trying to alleviate in, in these conversations is, does it impair you? Uh, just the existence of that ability for the CUD to take that on. Does it impair you from trying to bring your consortium of 17 towns kind of along the path? Um, that threat, which some towns could look at it as, oh, geez, if we join CV, uh, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, we might somehow be on the hook. So I mean, I mean that that language will always be brought out. It was even brought out when I pointed to statute and I says, actually, statute right here says that this is impossible. Right. Um, so, but it was it was brought up. So in new communications union districts, could that be an impediment? Maybe. But again, being able to point back to say it's always the citizens' vote on that bond issue that would be the thing stopping it from affecting your taxes at all. Mm -hmm. So w would it affect it? It, it could. But the margins that people voted to join the communications union district, and the language that I heard from the select boards who joined it after it was created, I'm, if we got a 10% reduction in support, we, we, it would have still pass in every town. It passes unanimously in a, a number of towns. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm personally not, not convinced that it's going to make that much of a dent, because the ultimate decision for taking on that debt still lies with the voters. Can you talk a little bit, Jeremy, about the capacity to uh, how how your CUD formed? So were these paid entities that kind of pulled this together? Was someone paid to organize this? Are the board members paid? Like, how has this come together? Sure. So um, I'm on the Berlin Select Board and town meeting 2017. Um, I, I should back up. Um, I got a lot of complaints from residents of the town of Berlin about their internet service, wh wherever they were. And I put out a survey to the town um, 
informally from Porch Forum or whatever, and, and asked a bunch of questions. And one of the things that came up was about internet service. So I thought about it and thought about it. And uh, if I'm going too long with my history lesson here, please, please stop me. Um, and as a technology geek myself and as someone who teaches networking, um, I sort of know the lay of the land. I know how to build networks. I've, I've maintained them professionally before. And I was looking around and trying to think about, you know, what's, what's the way that we could make something like this happen in Vermont? Because it, I, I wasn't seeing any motion in building out of actual, um, actual, no joke, broadband capacity in Vermont. And <clears throat> so I started looking around at, at different models, and I found um, there's a there's a wonderful podcast, the Community Broadband Bits podcast, and I was listening to Irv and Carol from EC Fiber talk about what they did in Vermont. I'm like, oh wow, this is already happening here, and I became aware of that of that effort. And so I actually brought to in 2017, I brought to um, I brought to town meeting as a, just a floor vote. I explained the situation. I said, is this something that the the voters of the town of Berlin would be interested in in pursuing? I said, I, I was going to spearhead this. And it was unanimous, yes. Including, I should say, the governor, who's a resident of the town of Berlin, was, was right up front on the left. Oh, good to know. Yeah. In, in what capacity were you going to spearhead this? Was, it, was this in a paid capacity? Nope. Or? I'm, as a select board member. I mean, select board members do get paid a little, <laughs> they get a handful of coins at the end of the year. Um, get paid in Hershey's kisses. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, if we're lucky. That's a, that would be a, a pay raise. Um, and so, and so I started um, learning more about uh, how the Communications Union District worked. I met with Carol, I met with Irv, um, I set up a meeting in Barry City in October of 2017 after I had heard from the folks in the town that they were interested in this. And I met with um, elected officials from Plainfield and Middlesex and all over central Vermont. And Irv and Carol came and gave a presentation. I presented my vision. We all sat down and just chatted. Um, and then I started meeting with other select boards. There was a select board member from Middlesex who took this back to Middlesex and voted to put it on the ballot for 2018 town meeting. It happened in Plainfield. And then I basically talked to almost every select board in Washington County and then in Williamstown. Uh, Elmore did it on their own. And no, I was not getting paid for this. I was doing this as a volunteer in my capacity as a select board member. And I just chased down all these people, went to all these meetings, and explained um, how communications union districts were formed, gave them as much information as I had about this, and then slowly but surely it started to come together. And I think we had 12 towns, ended up being 13 towns, that voted on it at town meeting, and it passed unanimously. In 18? What's that? In 18. In 2018, so March of, March of last year. And it passed in all those towns. Barry Towns town meeting doesn't happen until May. They passed it there. The town of Cabot, the town of Orange were added later by a vote of their select boards to apply to enter our district. Um, and we have a pending application from the town of Woodbury to also join. So each town appoints one board member. None of those board members are paid. As a matter of fact, I made the last time I was in here, I made this sort of like money shakedown joke. But now I was, we were much more serious about the money shakedown of our board members. And the reason that we have $5,000 in the bank right now is because our members put that money there. Our governing board members, I should say, put that money there. Um, so, no, I mean, it's, we, are, we are paying for the privilege to serve in the capacity of, of this governing board. So I'm just, uh, thank you, that was helpful. I'm trying to kind of just get after um, what are impediments to this happening in other places. And so, you know, one of them that I suspect is this, you know, who's, who's going to do it? And so, right. you know, not to ask you to toot your own horn, but as is the case in many places, it's, you know, one inspired individual um, that is, you know, getting the ball rolling. And that worries me, frankly, when I think about the entire state, you know, um, it, that we're just relying or hoping that there will be you know, a Jeremy Hansen in all of these corners of the state. Well, I'll so. even go beyond that. It's, it's beyond um, the, the entrepreneurial idea. It's also um, kind of relying on folks who have come before you to help the next person in line. Of course. And that's, you know, uh, as helpful, I think, as that has been to date. Um, 
like what if they're not there? But yeah, putting together a toolkit, I mean, I, I kind of scrabbled together my own toolkit of documents and data in my presentation and uh, you know, used my position as a select board member for some credibility there and was able to talk you know, select board member to select board member and say, yes, I know these, you know, these issues at the municipal level, but yeah, hand be able to hand somebody a package and say, give that not only technical uh, assistance, but also, you know, what's the, what's the kind of the political process, you know, establishing communications and talking to select board members and getting community buy-in. Uh, that's an important, it's an important process that uh, had I not sort of done those sorts of things before, I wouldn't really have known, I wouldn't have known how to proceed as much. And people who approach me saying, I want to start a CUD here or there or, or wherever, they're like, how did you learn how to do that? I'm like, I don't know. I just I just did it. But then they ask questions. They say, what do I do next? That's why I just keep feeding them all the data that I have, all the information that I have, and then they go and do the legwork. I, and it's my, I'm, I agree that a toolkit would be really helpful, but people do have to take responsibility Absolutely. in their own areas to do stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to be, you know, they're not just going to be handed down from Montpelier every, you know, sorry. Yeah. It's yeah, totally in good. my own totally total agreement. Because Montpelier's not going to solve the issue. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, um, so, speaking of the, the tools we have, the, the CUD is, is the tool we're operating with, but obviously the areas of need, the areas of feasibility don't follow town lines. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to like a, a ready, which can incorporate sections of towns. Um, so I guess I'm wondering about the, the benefits and liabilities of a CUD as it's defined, as opposed to something more flexible, a, a ready or a you know, some virtual community or. Um, so yeah, don't, don't get me wrong, ready districts are great. Mm -hmm. um, and as a matter of fact, you'll find that what's ready? Um, rural Economic Development Infrastructure District. Um, and th it does have the flexibility of going, you know, taking a part of a town or a part of two towns. Um, and I think it's a good model. And you'll find that a lot of the language and statute for the ready districts was simply copied and pasted from the communications union district statute, which is, which, which is good because I think it's, it's good language for the most part. Um, I think one of the things that ready districts may run into, though, is this idea of economies of scale. It's going to be much more expensive to do this in a part of town, or in one town, or even in two towns, um, and make it financially feasible. That's not to say that there aren't other models out there that we are not currently considering that couldn't make that work, but they're out there. And uh, actually, but I talked to the folks from the Newbury ReadyNet project on Tuesday, and actually suggested that one of them, um, one of them visit here today. But they were they were all booked up. Because uh, they want, they wanted to weigh in on some of these things too. Because they are, they're looking to do the same thing, but a much, from a much smaller perspective, with a different business model. Um, EC and CV seem to be building new networks from scratch, new utilities from scratch. Can you talk for a minute, a quick minute, about the the economics of? trying to do that instead of partnering with the, the First Lights, the Consolidated, the Comcast, the, the pre-existing utilities and leveraging their economies of scale to build out to your particular region? Sure. Um, so one of the things EC Fiber did, if I, if I can go to them for a moment, is they, they used some of the existing fiber capacity that was already in place from the Vermont Telecommunications Authority. Sure. So they were able to take advantage of that. But realizing that um, in, a certain, in a certain way, CV Fiber and EC Fiber are competitors of those entities. Um, it would be rather unlikely that they'd be willing to, you know, light up strands of their fiber to give us access when it could conceivably push down their their revenue. Um, so could could it work? It's possible, possible. Um, but the general consensus from everyone that I've talked to, um, here and there, um, is that. It's not really going to happen. It has not really happened in other parts of the country where you have a major telecommunications company offering part of their network to a competitor. It's just not it really happened. I guess what I'm picturing is something like uh, the CUD says, all right, we need to light up everybody in this circle mm -hmm. for lack of a better geometric shape. Sure. Um, 
take bids from the, the utilities that have the established infrastructure. Here's the minimum 100 to 100 that you're going to provide. Um, since internet is not a regulated utility, you can say, and here's the price you're going to charge these customers, how much is it going to cost you to do it? Um, Michael Birnbaum, who was here yesterday at Kingdom Fiber, went through this exact process that you're talking about up in Craftsbury, where mm -hmm. they, the, it was important for the town to go out and put this out to a competitive bid. It was part of their bidding process. It, it is in the town of Berlin, too. And they put it out to a bidding process, and there were some of the major providers who bid on the process, and Kingdom Fiber came in way under the asking price of the other of the other bids and at speeds that were far beyond what they were offering. So this is this process has happened. I mean it's it's not data, it's it's, it's one anecdote, but um, as I understand it, that process turned out in favor of the, the homegrown local okay. fiber provider. So last question. So we talked a little bit about um, my family and their hard pancake pictures that they keep thinking me with. Um, the, uh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we talked a little bit about uh, the capacity to do this um, and you know the volunteer effort really that's underway to do this. Um, with regard to the providers that are in the CB territory, which of course are <laughs> not operating on a volunteer scale, um, and are spending a lot of money in this building trying to influence policy. Have any of them come to you to suggest um, solutions? Uh, to say with a proposal for, hey, we understand you're trying to do X, here's how we could do it. Um, considering, you know, that this is what they do. No. I mean, so there is a local provider within our district. I'm kind of reluctant to talk about them too much. This is still sort of happening um, that I would like to partner with and that we have a way that we could reasonably partner with um, but that's hypothetical and I, I don't know if it's going to work out and who and who is the onus on really to figure that out at this point is that on you to figure it out um, well I've, I've taken it upon myself because um, regardless of what happens in this room it's my intention to build out fiber to the premises everywhere in our district period so these are tools that will help us get there more easily and more more cheaply for everybody, but I mean, it's 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 going to happen. Thank you very much. Thanks. So thank you for joining us. Chad. Well, thank you, thank you for thank you for having us here. Um, I think what you'll hear probably is a fair bit of commonality in terms of our our thoughts. I know I know some folks have submitted comments on H ninety five, Hospital ninety five, which we are in agreement with, um, just in terms of how to move forward. Um, uh, I think you'll hear some commonality. So I, mean, I think what you're going to find is Velco certainly in the D is very supportive of the committee's efforts to address the broadband issue, obviously a critical issue for Vermont. Uh, and we also share the belief that if we're going to move from where we are today to what is an enduring permanent solution, there, there's a paradigm shift necessary. It's very difficult to do this kind of incrementally. Uh, so thinking about what that interim solution is and how we move, as I said, from, from where we are today um, to, the, to that enduring solution is, is is a big step. Um, just want to point out, just remind folks, I know when we, when I was in kind of doing Velco 101, there was a little bit of, I know you guys were drinking from a fire hose, and so there was a little bit of confusion around the difference between Velco and the DUs. And actually, the, 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 the fundamental differences relate to fiber as well as electricity. So we are, we are kind of that middle mile, think of us as the, as the interstate highway system of Vermont or of, the, of New England. Uh, whereas the distribution utilities are really the roads in the towns and cities, so the, the, the smaller roads. We play the same role in fiber. The fiber that we put in uh, basically was put in to provide connectivity for our transmission system, uh, and so it's in the same locations, and it is that middle mile inter interstate highway fiber as well. Um, again, put in with the idea to support our system, but obviously as electronics improve on either end of that system, uh, there is capacity that's made available as a result of those upgrades. Um, as we think about House Bill 95 and, and kind of where some folks are talking about moving to a, moving to a paradigm where the utilities um, effectively, quote unquote, do broadband or become the primary engine behind the, the deployment of broadband uh, in Vermont, whether we define that as fiber to the home, whether we define that as a wireless solution or a hybrid, which is probably somewhere near the answer. Um, I think there's a lot to be addressed and assessed before we move from where we are to that being the end game solution. Um, there are certainly some pros and cons. Intuitively, it makes a lot of sense, but I think when you start to dig under the surface in terms of whether the utilities are best positioned to deploy that, so that ultimate enduring solution, I think remains to be seen. Um, 
what we believe um, are, are the right next steps forward. Um, really, from my perspective, and I may differ a little bit from, from the folks you're going to hear in the DU community on the, this, but is number one is we think actually having DPS do a much more detailed study um, that ground truths a number of things. Uh, number one is, and I know that there's a lot of work going on in this committee to do this at this at, right now, which is what does success look like? What is that enduring solution? Is it fiber to every premise in Vermont? Is it wireless? Is it a, is it a hybrid of the two? Um, what kind of speeds are we talking about? And when we think about defining speed for a future generation, it's not about a defined speed. It's about something that's indexed to an FCC or some kind of industry norm that we want to be at 35 or 50 percent or 70 percent of the optimum speed or more um, sustainably through the future. And that, that informs how you think about the infrastructure you deploy. Because much like the, the Velcro fiber system, you want to deploy a system that's got the ability to increase in capacity as electronics and technology evolve and as the speeds evolve around the country. So bottom line is we don't build a system for today, we build a system for tomorrow. And that's, that is a very different paradigm. Um, other things that we could ground truth, really getting fantastically accurate data as to what is on the ground today in Vermont. What, it, where, what is being served, what isn't being served, there are different definitions. We've looked, as you well know, uh, at a number of pilot opportunities, and we're struggling to, def to fully understand what's on the ground today and what's, what is served versus unserved. What's the, what speeds are people being served at? Is that sufficient? Um, what are expected uptake rates? How much, how much are people really willing to pay, incrementally pay for this service? Because that obviously informs how you think about a funding model um, and making sure that if we actually build this system that it's going to be fully utilized in Vermont. I think that's an important thing to ground truth. We've done some of that, and I'll talk about that in a minute briefly. Um, there certainly are some models from other states. I know you probably looked at a number. DPS has looked at a number. I think there are models from other states where there are significantly rural populations that probably could serve to inform an ultimately enduring solution um, with utilities. With utilities, potentially with utilities through the through the creation of a telecommunication or broadband co-op model, um, which actually potentially avails yourself you, to would avail to the state to a different level of funding, a uh, different style of funding, whether it's RUS or some other. Uh, level of funding, much like when, when electrification was deployed in Vermont and other places decades ago. Um, so I think a, a, a funded study at the DPS that really looks at what are the different opportunities to move, the, move to that enduring solution, what are the things that need to be ground truth, and in parallel with that, I don't, I don't want the idea of a study to make it sound as though I'm suggesting or we're suggesting that we stand pat, is the continued progress towards a pilot. Um, finding, we have, we have as, as folks are on this committee are probably aware, DPS reached out to Velco a number of months ago, eight, six, six or eight months ago, um, to seek our help with thinking about how to define a pilot location where we could actually deploy a broadband pilot, uh, again, to be defined in terms of the solution, i.e. fiber to the home or wireless or both, um, where we would be able to, through that pilot, um, learn and, as I say, ground truth a number of different facts that would help inform how we think about a statewide solution, a broader solution. I, th I know there's a lot, Laura, I know Representative Sebelia has done a lot of work. We certainly have a number of conversations around how to define a pilot or pilot sites. Um, we have actually, in some of the towns where we have looked at, we have gone as far as ground truthing, how much would it cost to build infrastructure to every premise in the town? What would likely uptake rates be and how would that inform the, the financial viability based on the models we're looking at? Um, what is the service today and, and how do we think people would respond to a significantly higher speed? So we've done a lot of the work. I do think a pilot, uh, funding a pilot and moving towards a pilot in the near term, uh, we would love to see a pilot get off the ground within a year, um, at least in one or two or more communities, uh, again, that could inform. We think having a study done about an, around enduring solutions and a pilot to address and help us inform some of the questions that remain uh, is a really good way forward. And that, that is all the comments that I have. Okay. Um, so, with regard to mapping, yes. So, I would love for you to be as specific and granular as possible about what you need yep. and what the impediments are. Absolutely. Because we hear this discussed vaguely, yep. generally, um, and you know it just kind of keeps getting tossed out yep. as you know it's a problem. Yep. So, can you do that? I can, or can certainly take it away and come back to you with much more detail. I know, yeah. I know Mike Lucy, who works for me, and I know yeah. you're, you're familiar with Mike, um, has done a lot of that working with Clay at the department mm -hmm. to address where we think the gaps are in the current maps versus what we would need to really fundamentally uh, ground truth 
Um, in fact, we have actually we've done a bit of that. Some in your some in your territory and some in the Morrisville uh, Hardwick territory. We've actually taken a step of driving around the towns to look and see what is actually physically there versus what's on the publicly available maps, and there are significant gaps. So I don't have that data today, Representative, but I will certainly bring it. We'll certainly get that to you. And are you, and you're talking about wired and yes. wireless? Yes. Yes. Mostly wired, but wired and wireless. Yeah, really getting specific yeah. about the nature of the um, impediment. So, yes. I mean, if yes. we have some proprietary issues. And then, um, with regard to the pilot, this is a question that is starting to really occur to me. Um, and CUDs, which is what we're yeah. starting to really circle around, can you just talk about this pilot, a, a pilot and CUDs, like how that would be in service to kind of... Well... One could argue that the, the, the CUD approach maybe is not an enduring solution in, from a statewide perspective, but I do think a pilot, um, a pilot, and I think Patty Richards may talk a little bit more about what WEC is up to, um, regardless of how a pilot moves forward, and if a pilot is done through a CUD structure, um, we're still going to ground truth a lot of the same things, right? We're going to understand um, what it costs to deploy fiber, um, what the uptake rates look like. We're going to begin to get an understanding of what are the ongoing operation and maintenance hurdles that, that, a, that a broader fiber system presents and who is best positioned to, to, to do that kind of ultimately in a centralized way. Um, so I don't necessarily, I think, I think however we feel, and you and I have had this conversation, however we feel we can, wherever we can get the most traction so that if we actually do a pilot, the pilot is successful. Um, and allows us to learn. Anything we learn that we don't know today, I think, helps us move towards a more enduring solution. And, and so, just to be a little more specific, the pilot is around utilities bringing out uh, broadband certainly, certainly, utilizing certainly the utility an option. infrastructure. Certainly an option. Yeah. Certainly okay. an option. Yes. Thank you. Um, in, in regards to your uh, middle mile fiber <coughs> making it available to people, in the telecom plan, the department talked about their middle mile fiber, and I think they said that utilization rates have been disappointing. Yes. Um, and I'm sort of, if you build it, they still won't come. And I'm wondering if you're finding the same thing. Of course, our, the, the, uh, the, initial, the initial catalyst for Belco to strengthen fiber, um, which was to have a much better real-time understanding of what's going on in our, on our transmission system, um, the, the fiber has been a tremendous benefit to Vermont. To Rolco and ultimately to the state of Vermont. I think I may have mentioned the last time I was here there was a there was a fault on a PV20 line, which is a line that goes through Lake Champlain uh, over to New York State. The other side is operated by NIPA. A helicopter impacted the line on the New York side, and within three electrical cycles, because of the fiber connectivity that we had, we were able to reswitch the system so that didn't cause cascading outages for, in Vermont. Um, so that kind of real-time information is critically valuable. Beyond that, we've done some things to utilize that middle mile fiber, like connecting the Northern Vermont universities. Linden and Johnson. Um, so that, that's what I'm interested The third party. The third party. Yeah. Uh, so we've, we've begun to do some of those things kind of that are a little bit, you could argue, outside of our core mission. Um, but what's, what's happened, as I talked about, what's happened with that fiber is as the electronics on either end of that fiber have improved, the available capacity of the fiber that we installed years ago has increased. And so there is clearly, I mean, I think we, we said something around 50% utilization of, our, of that middle mile fiber for our purposes and the purposes like connecting the colleges. Uh, but there is still significant capacity there, and we believe that will only increase potentially as those electronics improve. So, um, uh, go ahead, Mark. Uh, <clears throat> is, is your fiber within the electric lines? In other words, is it, there going to be is. an issue with it? With, is. Okay, so, it is. so it's not real feasible to do individual connections. It's more of a, you, you talked about the colleges, so that's kind of a direct line. Right. So we did we did build some additional fiber to get to the colleges, but what you're getting at really more in the distribution space, and probably a good question for the distribution utilities, is the pros and cons of running fiber in the electric space on distribution infrastructure. Uh, one could argue there is a there is a there is a positive in the sense that you can probably reduce costs by running in electric space um, just because of efficiency, and then it's just a question of the make-ready work that, that you need to do to drop into a space that can feed homes and businesses. Um, but there are, there are cons to that. For example, the only people that can work in electric space are fully trained and qualified electric linemen. That's a lot more expensive than somebody who works in a safer space down below. So mm -hmm. there are pros and cons. I'm probably not the most qualified person to tell you what those are, but all of ours is in the electric space. 
So I'm going to ask you the last question. Sure. And then, um, uh, in the context of some of the legislation we're considering, including um, you know this feasibility, um, there's also discussion about a pilot, which you yes. talked about. Um, and there's a there's a cart and horse question that I have. Um, some of the things that the feasibility study look at is um, actually enabling legislation that could come out of that feasibility study that would allow um, some of our electric utilities um, to actually operate in this space. Um, but a pilot project suggests that we're allowing uh, utilities to operate in that space. Um, so again, I'm, I'm just from a legislative standpoint, trying to think about the pacing of these things. Um, and from my perspective, the pace is as fast as possible. Right? But um, also being aware of what can be done and what has to be, um, you know, kind of granularly studied from a um, from a statutory perspective right. first. So um, th th there's a kind of a big thing that we've got to figure out as a committee, and, and that you may be helping us with in the coming weeks. Absolutely. What? How do those two things fit together? A pilot where you're going to, you know, looking at doing this in a town or a, 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 an area relative to actually kind of feasibility study and what, what has to be done. I think they're, I think they're actually, I think they're very um, symbiotic together okay. because I think the pilot, uh, if we pick the right community and we go about, we go about it the right way, as I said earlier, I think it really allows you to get real-time understanding of some of the critical things that need to inform that feasibility study and that ultimate solution um, that hopefully we, we can reach and, and that's enduring for the state of Vermont. Um, I, as I said, I think things around costs and how, what's the best way to do it, in electric space, out of electric space, how do we think about funding and maybe we look at different funding models. Maybe we try a wireless pilot in an area that, that, we're, that seems much, much more apt for a near term, some of Rep Representative Sebelius' territory, and see how it works. Does it really work? There are certainly challenges topographically in Vermont with a wireless broadband deployment, but let's, let's try those. Let's see what works. Let's see what doesn't work. Understand how people react. I think it would be great to be able to get some kind of lens into the value if you, in, the, in the communities where the pilots are rolled out. What is the economic, devel economic development value of, of that increased connectivity? Do businesses come? Do people move to those towns? Um, I think I think there's a, I don't think there's I don't think there's there's much to be lost in a pilot uh, as long as it's designed with an eye towards um, that longer term enduring solution. And I'll just say one more thing about that longer term enduring solution, and then I promise I'll be quiet and, and step away. Which which is, if I were came for a day and somebody came to me and said, how would you solve the infrastructure problems of Vermont? And I would lay out and say, what are the biggest infrastructure problems? How do we get to 90 by 50 is a huge issue for Vermont. And that involves electrification of transport. It involves electrification of the thermal sector, the heat sector. Uh, it involves, obviously, solving things like Shi'i and making sure that Vermont is a place where we can deploy more renewables, not less. Um, somehow, as I think holistically about policy and moving policy forward, broadband fits in there. They're not in silos. And if I'm thinking about electrification of transport, I'm obviously talking about additional connectivity to homes. Um, and charging and those kinds of things. And stacking a broadband, an enduring broadband solution in, inside that broader connectivity solution, I think actually probably has symbiotic benefits, synergistic benefits. So with that, I will. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I hadn't mentioned when John was up. Um, we record all our um, testimony, so if you can identify yourself for the record. And I'm Brian Otley from Green Mountain Power. I'm the Chief Operating Officer. Thanks for having me. Take it away. Okay, so um, I'm not going to... John covered a lot of ground. He covered a lot of ground that I agree with, so I'm not going to cover the ground. Um, I, what I thought I would do is I had... Um, I've been shared some language that the committee has been working up. I provided some feedback on that. I thought I'd just review that, and then if questions come up, you know, take it from there. That's great. So um, the first concept in the language I saw for H95 <coughs> um, was very consistent with what John said. Is um, I think it's really important to be clear about the goal. Um, you know, broadband is a is a broad term. Broadband can be misinterpreted regularly. Broadband can be talked about without any sort of shared uh, definition uh, between like-minded like people and it can cause confusion. So um, I think it's really important to get specific about what is the objective. Is it last? Is it fiber to the home? 
Is it a fixed location broadband solution, which is a wired solution? Is it a mobile broadband solution, which would imply wireless? Is it a combination of the two? Um, that, <clears throat> without that clear definition of what problem is trying to be solved, we're going to wander around in the wilderness for quite a bit, as we have for, for years. Um, so I, su I suggested some language uh, that I think can, can um, help there. Uh, the second concept is um, I think in any study uh, it's really important to include uh, the current competing telcos. Um, they have a place in this. Um, uh, they have a past, they have a track record, and they're probably going to have a future. And so um, whatever study is done, absolutely Velco, the distribution utility should be um, deeply involved in that. Um, as organized by the Department of Public Service, but uh, I also think including the telcos in all of that discussion and assessment and evaluation is, is important. So I offered some language around that. And then um, finally around uh, speeds, um, uh, consistent with what John said as well, I'm not a fan of naming an absolute speed, whether it's 25 up and 25 down. Those speeds are going to change over time. The definition of broadband five years ago is very different than it is today. It will be very different than it will be five years from now. The FCC has a standard uh, a definition of broadband that evolves over time. And so hitching the cart to some percentage of what that FCC standard is, or multiple, or multiple over time, <laughs> I think is the best thing. Because as soon as you name an absolute number, whether it's 25 up, 25 down, you're gonna you're gonna go to that number, and as soon as you get there, you're gonna be obsolete. So so hitch it to a standard. That's the way you look longer term and try to future proof things. Um, and the technologies today, thankfully, broadband in the past was was typically a hardware solution, where the hardware uh, would be upgraded with new hardware that had physical limitations to it. And when that re reached obsolescence, that got upgraded by more hardware. Broadband solutions today and going forward are software solutions. Software. Uh, runs independent of hardware and can be upgraded without uh, replacing physical assets and provide higher speed properties and higher speed characteristics uh, without you know, physically having to touch the gear, which is a, is a real breakthrough. That's kind of the gist of what I, the feedback I had provided. I'm happy to discuss um, so one more thing. Well, the other thing I would think about is um, distribution utilities offering broadband. That's a big departure from our mission or from what our historic mission has been. It's a worthy departure, I think, um, but in the, in the years ahead, um, I think be thoughtful about what is the best use of distribution utility resource and thinking. Right now, almost all of the DUs in the state are really focused on carbon and getting carbon out of our economy. Um, Vermont has a real chance to be a world leader in doing that. We're a leader today and we have a, we have a chance to continue that leadership position and be a role model for the rest of the country and the world. Um, developing a new broadband line and offering those services directly, that is that is not trivial. That's a brand new skill set and so like any organization, uh, focus is where you get your best results. So just be thoughtful about um, what's the best use of DU uh, distribution utility uh, resource and focus right now. Um, is it is it you know helping to solve the broadband problem or is it um, you know, continuing the attack on, on getting fossil fuels out of our economic activity. Um, I would say it's, I, I am inspired by the fossil challenge. Um, we're happy to help with the broadband, but if, if we're going to be, from my position, if we're going to be delivering end-use broadband to customers, that's a, you know, that's a big new service line that will take a lot of our resource to stand up. Um, so just think about that. Um, I agree completely with what you say, but also I've seen some, uh, synergy in there yep. that you know if if we can uh, move electrons instead of people that's that's a huge step in the yeah, decarbonization <coughs> yeah i mean broadband definitely is an enabler uh to to uh a lot of the clean energy challenges we're trying to implement mm -hmm. um you will find for our for our own use um most of the broadband need for energy use cases it's pretty small bandwidth stuff it's not we're, we're not we're never going to be the to, to implement our solutions we don't we don't physically need these you know huge pipes to, to do that that's consumer life right. stuff but you're right there's a synergy and there's an adjacency absolutely I'm just noting that the the bill is as drafted uh, lists uh, electric utility distribution 
operating uh, program is only one option to consider. So that's not it. Yeah, okay, great. Right. I'm wondering about the technical side of uh, if 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 uh, fiber is run in the, in the electric space, um, does it require? Does that require? Um, um, Every connection to a house, every connection to a premises, to, to come off of that space, or is there is there a way of uh, having sort of drops that would facilitate a sort of a, a, a local network of, of, of uh, fiber to the premises that could be inst installed and maintained by by uh, communications workers rather than rather than the line workers? Yeah, you see what I'm asking. I do, I do. The and, and don't confuse the. Um, fiber today runs on our poles, just not in the electrical space. Right, but, I'm, but the, uh, the option of running in the electrical space is, is one that's been talked about, so that's, that's why I'm asking about it. Yeah and, yeah, and frankly, I don't understand the fixation on that. The, as long as it's on the pole, it's, yeah. it's going to be running It's going to be running roadside, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. passing whatever whatever residents are, are yeah. located on that right. roadside. So the physical placement on the pole in the electrical space, I think, is a it, it's not a it's, it's to be considered, but it's not. It should. I don't think it'll affect. It should affect your decision making on this. You're thinking on this too much. Um, as John said, if it's in the electrical space, that confines the types of workers who can actually touch that. Right. And so fiber below the electrical space actually is a more flexible option. Right. Um, but but yeah, the the typical um, the typical setup now is um, you know fiber drops are done to you know a, a cabinet in front of each premise and then in that's where the splicing premises. happens and then goes, you know, that last however many feet to, to the actual home. Um, so there's a fiber drop at each at each premise. There has to there right? has to be some sort of a, a splice connection there so that the uh, you know the, the bigger the bigger fiber can get down to what's necessary to go to the house. Um, but that's you know that's that exists today in a lot of areas of the state. I, you know, I'm one of the lucky people. I live in a fairly rural part of Vermont, and I got fiber in my house last year. It was like, oh, it was great. <laughs> um, but, but you know, it was uh, it was not a small little construction activity on the road for the better part of a few months, and uh, and it was just nice that my local provider was able to do that. But that that type of splicing and that type of service delivery is very common, and people know how to do that all day. Okay. So Brian, I'm going to give myself the last question. Yeah. Again. And. Uh, uh, I don't know if this has been fully thought through or if this is um, in its infancy of thinking through, and this is really where we need to go with a feasibility study. Um, so as a um, highly regulated entity um, that has a very um, prescribed business model, um, talking about um, providing uh, broadband uh, uh, service to customers, which is not a regulated um, world, how does that um, how does that dovetail into your existing model? Is it um, viewed as something that will be um, embraced as part of a highly regulated business model? Um, is it looked at as a, um, a holding company that is unregulated? Um, how will it affect your rate case um, that you take before the PUC? If, to what extent yeah. um, have you and, and others in the room, frankly, who are going to sit in that chair? Um, has that been thought through? Yeah, great question. And those are all questions we have. It, yeah. it's you, you, I think you can do anything you, you want, but it's got to get approved and, uh, and the model will, will be dictated based on how things get effectively get paid for. So, um, you know, our, our model today is you know, very tightly regulated and our, our charter uh, around electric distribution um, is all part of that regulated business model. We have ver very, very few uh, unregulated businesses that are fall under our umbrella, our operating umbrella. Um, uh, one of the questions we would have is exactly what you're asking, which is, will this be considered a regulated activity or an unregulated activity? If it is unregulated, you know, who, what is the funding source for those services and, and how do they get paid back? If it's regulated, will it be included in the utility uh, rate base and then is that, uh, is that an appropriate um, investment for electric customers to be making to be able to deliver broadband services to some of the customers. Yeah. I don't know the answer to those questions. Those are really important questions, uh, but those are ones that you know. As these concepts get formulated, we have those we have those questions. We don't have the answers to them. Yeah, you know, we're not we're not allowed to give our own answers. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Yes, thanks. Appreciate it.
Hello, for the record, I'm Andrea Kahn. I'm from our electric cooperative. And I'll cut this way back because you really have hit a lot of what we were going to share. So I'll just um, start by thanking you for taking this issue on. It's complicated and it's really important. And it's important to our communities and it's important to our business as well. Um, so, you know, thriving, uh, vibrant communities are, you know, going to help us not leave those rural communities behind. So, um, you know, the spirit of, of these comments and what we'd like to do is to be a collaborative partner in this. Um, we, uh, so we welcome your leadership. We welcome the investigation, all these questions that you were just talking to Brian about, and the very questions that um, come up in our boardroom and with our leadership team as we talk about um, you know, a lot of attention on what role can we play and what should we do and how do we add value to this. And uh, those issues about you know, a regulated utility jumping into a competitive, risky, unregulated market. You know, one, one of our board members actually said, let's just uh, stick to our knitting. You know, let's like, sure. do what we need to do and do it well. Um, if you know the history of the co-op, uh, we're on very strong financial footing now. Rebecca Town was just in a week or two ago talking about you know our A plus bond rating and all. The first thing we say is, well, we like we've worked so hard to get on strong financial footing to jump into a risky business would require a lot of thinking and a lot of analysis, a lot of you know being thoughtful. So um, we would expect if if we do a feasibility study with DPS, those kinds of issues would you know come out. Those conversations to do well compensated, well trained line workers. You know, should they be stringing fibers? Should you know, is that the role we play? You know, what is the role? How do we add value? How do we you know, help move us along because it, it benefits our communities, it benefits our members uh, as a nonprofit cooperative. That's our primary motivation. It also uh, helps our own business because um, our vision for the future about you know how we're going to deliver cost-effective, reliable, clean energy will rely on robust you know uh, broadband in our communities. We're we're going to want to control when cars are charging and when you know, how we're going to control load and shift uh, peaks. And we need those communities to have robust. So we're invested and we want to be part of this. So um, as you look at the language, um, one of the things that we might suggest, we, we agree with everything Brian um, and John had offered in terms of some tweaks to the language. Uh, you know, let it be a, a collaborative, pro like, I, I think an assessment of what do we bring to the table. We might not bring everything, but we certainly have some things we can bring. Um, and we're starting those conversations now with some of the smaller uh, fiber groups like uh, Mansfield Fiber, uh, Kingdom Community Fiber. We're having, we're taking meetings now with them. Basically, just say, what, what do you need from us? You know, how do we help facilitate? Because we want to see this work too. So. Um, we would say as part of this uh, study or feasibility, you know, is an assessment of what do the utilities bring, what can we bring, where do we add value, and how do we, you know, help move it along. Um, I just think I think I can leave it to you know. We talked about risky environment. Uh, that's new for us. We could do anything, but how much will it cost for us to do it is a fair question. So I think that would get teased out too as we do this. So we welcome you know that analysis, and I think that's. My short version of my testament. Go ahead, Mike. No, no. So, so um, it sounds like you're saying that uh, distribution utilities can bring value to the table, but you need you want to be working with partners instead of doing it yourself. I think right now that's that's what the conversation in our boardroom and there's no consensus necessarily. We have board members that are like, we should just do this and jump in, and others are like, what you, no way, you know, this is very risky and hard. I think we're just starting from that point of almost just like, okay, we know we can bring value. How do we how do we help move it along without jumping all in? Uh, those questions about what's the business model, you know, it, we'd have to create a whole nother business. We're relatively small. Would that pull resources away from you know other things? I don't know how we would do. And then the cost shifting conversation then comes in. You know we have uh, different different members have different needs for this. You know how robust of a system and should we ask? You know the forty percent of our members who are fixed and low income, actually more if we put those together over fifty percent. Mm -hmm you know, to pay for infrastructure that they don't necessarily need. You know, is that the right place to go for funding it or not? So, so your poles and wires, do they have fiber installed with them now? A, a lot of them do. A lot of them do? Yeah. And, but you use that primarily for grid management? 
Uh, I'm not the right person to answer how we're using that. It's more for our substations. It's not for to right. right you can help me. You know more than I know about our system. It's it's really just uh, our our subs and managing load. So when we are <coughs> conducting this usability um, and and being sensitive to the chair's question earlier, so we have the Department of Public Service currently. Um, listed, who is your regulator, conducting this study. How do you, you know, do we put some of you on that um, assessment? Like, do you have any thoughts about who should? Are you looking to have like an advisory committee? I don't maybe. Know. Yeah, I, don't I mean, know. I mean, the department. Uh, so we're asking the department right. to do it, and now to I'm consult with and thinking about us, this. consult with the telecoms the current providers, consult with the the municipal entities. There's a lot of players here. We all bring something. Yeah, you know, that's the interesting thing.